Why are pretty much all employers looking for integration skills? Well, that's because integrations are all around us. Salesforce is very rarely the only platform that a company uses, so you have to build integrations to connect all of those systems together and pass data around. So in this video, I'm gonna be going over the Salesforce integration developer roadmap that I have created. This roadmap is meant to give you an overview of specific areas you should be focusing in on if you want to learn integrations in the Salesforce platform. There's a lot of stuff on this list and there's even technically an expanded version of this that has additional links on it and resources that you can check out. All of this is completely free for you to jump in on, but of course, if you're just starting out or you're learning Salesforce integrations a little bit more, definitely check this out and piecemeal it. Focus in on the specific areas that I talk about here and then expand out to other sections that employers are actually looking for. In my experience doing Salesforce development for about 10 years now, here are the areas that you want to focus on and then you can expand out from there. Okay, jumping in on the Salesforce integration roadmap, I've broken it down into a few key areas. So we have API basics, advanced APIs, REST integrations, which is probably where you want to focus the bulk of your education on, and then best practices. A lot of the different architectures, patterns, and things you should look out for when you are designing integrations. So let's start over here in API basics we can see that there are a few concepts that you want to really nail down before you even try to move into the other sections. Now, nailing down the concepts doesn't mean you need to go out and create the entire integrations related to a lot of these topics. It's more understanding the vocabulary and how these different integrations work. First up, we're gonna have REST APIs, and these are the most popular APIs that are created nowadays. A lot of the integrations that you write today are going to be REST integrations. So they are very standard, very lightweight, very easy to use and understand. They have different HTTP methods that they use. So things like get, post, put, head, delete. So a lot of those methods you'll have to do some research on and understand, but it's really the vocabulary around this, which is going to be great for you as soon as you start to step into either creating your own integrations or reviewing integrations from other people. Also super important are the response codes. So understanding when you're communicating between two separate systems, how do they know either everything worked or was there an error or is it informational? Understanding the response codes can be critical. And what's funny is, as just people on the internet, you've probably seen some of these res response codes before, and now as a developer, you'll understand what they mean. So like the 404 errors or 500 errors, once you dive into what the response code mean, then you'll be able to understand them a little bit better. We also have SOAP API. So these are a little bit more legacy. I haven't written a SOAP API in a few years personally, but they are out there and they are very security conscious. So if you're working with companies that are dealing with potentially PII or extremely sensitive data, you will most likely be writing a SOAP API. And with SOAP APIs comes a thing called a WSDL. A WSDL in a nutshell is just the file that gets created to make sure that the two systems know that they're talking correctly with each other and with the same exact system. There are two different types of WSDLs, the enterprise and the partner WSDL. Knowing the difference of those is really good and it's probably like an exam question to understand the different types of WSDLs. So definitely check those out and get a good understanding of what the WSDLs are, how to generate them, and how to kind of use them. But setting up SOAP APIs, they are a little more cumbersome and I think there's probably trails on it and trailheads that will help you go through those. Then we have just some general Salesforce technologies and terminologies that you want to be familiar with. So remote site settings, this is a big one, especially if you're doing your own integration. So it's basically allowing your system or your Salesforce to talk to another system. It's just giving access to it. The governor limits are always important to keep an eye on. There are limits around the number of callouts you can do, things can time out, and there are specific limitations around like asynchronous processing, transactions, and stuff like that. So good to be aware of. 
Then there are connected apps, which is a way for a different system to communicate with your Salesforce. This one is pretty big if you've either installed things from the app exchange to just understand how to sync up and set your Salesforce up to receive data. Speaking of data, there are some pretty key data, I guess, types, different ways of transferring that data around from the different systems that are potentially very important. JSON, probably the one that is used the most often. So you want to be familiar with JSON, understand the key value structure and the objects and how arrays are set up. But there is also XML and CSVs, which data often gets transferred around as but primarily, if you just want to learn one, if you're going to focus in on one, then jump into JSON and get that understanding there. Moving on over into REST, let's take a look at some of the key areas in here. We've got outbound calls and then inbound calls. So an outbound call is it's originating from Salesforce and we're doing a request to another system. Where an inbound call is another system is doing the request and they're they're sending information or interacting with our Salesforce call, but we are not the originator. We're the, I guess, destination in that specific instance. And in here, we have some key things that you want to start looking into as you write your first Apex code related to integration. We have understand the terminology and some key aspects of things inside of the API basics. And then now we want to actually start writing Apex code to see what it looks like and what a lot of these things are. So for every Apex callout that we make, we want to add in the request and the response. You pretty much need these for every callout that you make. It's basically boilerplate for doing the actual requests. And of course, inside of here, you're gonna be setting the URL or the endpoint is what it's called that we're gonna be sending data into or asking for information from. All of that is set up under the HTTP. You won't be able to do any callouts without having these two classes in here. Now, wrapper classes are optional, but they make your code a little bit easier to maintain and to write. So instead of having to parse out crazy amounts of JSON, you can create a wrapper class and then deserialize it so that it is very easy to manipulate an object instead of having to deal with some sort of crazy JSON that has a bunch of nesting inside of it. Continuing with the actual call out, there are some concepts that you want to be familiar with and that is around the transaction and how to actually do the call out itself. If you've never written any code for a call out, you might try to do it on a trigger and run into an error. When you do a call out, it needs to be asynchronous and that is because you don't want your users waiting on the other system to return data or return information back in. It could take up to five minutes for that data to return. And if your user is sitting there and it's just spinning, 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 then it will not be a great user experience. So that's where you have a lot of these concepts over here, which add an asynchronous functionality or requests to your call out. So you're splitting up the transaction with the at future or queuables or batches so that it's not happening right away. It's happening sometime in the future and then your data just gets returned. Just as a pro tip, you kind of want to stay away from using the at future annotation. It's not really deprecated yet, but queuables are just superior in pretty much every way. So if you're not learning queuables and how to do the chaining and stuff like that, definitely start to look into that for all the code that you are writing. So let's bounce back down over here into our inbound call. So these are exposing Salesforce resources, Salesforce endpoints to other systems. So this can be done very easily using the Salesforce API. All the other system needs to do is authenticate and then they'll have access to a lot of the different APIs that are available in Salesforce so they can query records, get data back. As long as they are authenticated, they can do a lot of things inside of your Salesforce org. So of course you need to be cognizant of the security aspect around that, but they can pull records back or even update your page layouts using the metadata APIs. So this one is pretty cool, but you can also make custom web services. So this is potentially exposing Apex methods and your internal code that you wrote, not just in a publicly available API, but code that you wrote to do specific actions. So think of it as they're sending you data and you want to process it in a specific way, kick off multiple 
automations or business logic that just using the normal Salesforce API would not work. So with custom web services, you have some concepts that are kind of universal, like wrapper classes, you can use them again, but there's also the REST resource annotation that is a good one to take note of, and this is how you expose your custom Salesforce Apex code to external sites or integrations. Let's roll down into the realm of best practices. So some of these could be very advanced, but I want you to at least be aware of some of the terminology. And anytime you implement an API, try to either add some of these pieces in as you start building upon your knowledge. The first section is on just general integration patterns. There are some well-established integration patterns that you can follow that help you build out your integrations in a well thought out manner. A lot of it is scalable. A lot of it is for different use cases. So review all of these doesn't mean you need to do all of them right away, but at least review all of them. And whenever you're building an integration, try to identify if it falls into one of these patterns. And then of course, read on it to learn a little bit more, or even find some examples around it. Now for your data parsing and responses, you have serialization and deserialization. So this is just a way of taking your formatted data, let's say like a custom object that you have a record of and either turning it into a format that an integration can understand that you can send it across into another system or deserializing, so taking information from another system and turning it into something that you can understand. A lot of the times these are normally around using JSON deserialization, so converting that JSON information into a structure that you can actually use inside of your Apex. You won't get very far with Salesforce development without writing some tests. So there is a key concept for the outbound callouts, which is an HTTP mock. Mocks are really important for understanding how to test your callouts and being able to test them successfully without actually calling another service. And think about it this way, you wanna mock your data because if the other system doesn't have a sandbox or whenever you hit their endpoint, it potentially charges money, it can be very costly to write a test on that system. Now I've dropped in some error handling topics here that are super important. We've got logging, timeout management, and retry logic. At the bare minimum, you want to log your interactions that are happening. They don't have to be super in-depth for your web services or your callouts. Just whenever you receive information or if you're sending it out, log it to some sort of custom object where you can hold on to that data just in case anything goes wrong. And of course I had to throw in monitoring and documentation. Monitoring kind of goes hand in hand with logging, but it can be a lot more than that. And there are entire Salesforce products that are built around monitoring your API interactions. And of course, documentation, just do yourself a favor, your future self or the future person that picks up your work, try to document it the best you can. There are some well-defined API documentation specifications. So look into things like Swagger or just put it all in the Google Doc or ChatGPT and see if it can spit out some information, some documentation around the integration that you are writing. Finally, let's head over to API Advanced. This is gonna talk about some things that are specific to the Salesforce ecosystem and then start expanding out even more into general integration technologies and patterns that you wanna follow, things that you should know of as you start writing more complex integrations. So let's start over here just on the Salesforce section. There is a lot out here and especially if you're first getting started, I don't want you to be overwhelmed by trying to understand all of these items in here, but I do want you to review all of them and try to understand if you can, instead of writing an API from scratch, use some of these tools that will better suit the situation that you're working in. So there's things like Salesforce Connect, which will automatically do connections with other databases through OData. So if you see that your integration is working with OData, you can definitely heavily consider using Salesforce Connect. Platform events are great for the PubSub model. And of course there's LWC if you have some sort of user interface 
associated to it. I don't want to forget Composition API either, which is an amazing way of sending out multiple requests or doing multiple requests into Salesforce. So you can do get requests and post requests inside of the same request that you do. Super powerful. And if you see yourself doing multiple requests back to back for your API to work, look at the Composition API because it can definitely help save you a ton of time. Then we have authentication. So throughout the process of you writing any integrations yourself, you're probably going to use some form of authentication in there. And now this section just expands on that a lot more by talking about all the different ways or a lot of the ways that you can authenticate your integrations or the callouts that you are making. If you need an area to look for to focus on, definitely check out name credentials and external credentials. These are key and are the bare minimum when you are writing Salesforce integrations. The other items in here will come as you start writing more complex ones, but I would also recommend focusing on OAuth integrations because they are super popular and very secure. Then we have the other technology sections, and this could balloon out to be a ton of things. I've included a lot of middleware items in here, and this should probably be its own section, but these tools are just used to integrate with Salesforce on some sort of level. So there are simpler ones like Zapier to super complex ones like MuleSoft, which is actually a product owned by Salesforce. So once again, as you start to write more integrations, review some of the options that we have at your disposal to understand if it is a better solution or if you can even refactor some of the code that you wrote to use some of these tools. A lot of times where these start to come into play is when you really start to work at scale. So you have millions of records coming through or 20 different systems that need to connect with each other. You want to start looking into some of these different technologies because they will help make your life a lot easier. I threw GraphQL in here as well. It's like a new version of REST, which can grab data, only the data that you need. It is starting to become more popular, but most integrations that I've seen still use regular REST integrations, but GraphQL may be something good to really focus on in the future. And of course, I had to throw SSO in here, so single sign-on. It is a form of authentication and integration so that your callouts are secure or your users are seeing the data that they need to see. So we covered a lot here in this integration roadmap, but some of the key things that I want you to remember in API basics, get some of that vocabulary down, try some super simple APIs out in tools like Postman, then jump into creating integrations on your own in the rest section. So these could be following Trailhead or creating an integration or a uh, call out that you have wanted to do in the past. For best practices, as you're writing your APIs out, start to look at some of the individual sections in here to see if they apply to the code that you are writing or if you can try some of them out, like logging, monitoring, and of course the testing aspects of it. And then in API Advanced, you want to be familiar with a lot of the topics here. How I learned some of this stuff was rewriting some of the basic REST Apex APIs that I had created into some of these newer versions to really understand what's going on under the hood. And then of course the authentication section, that will come as you go, but it's really important to at least be familiar with name credentials and OAuth so that you can connect and be super secure. So this is the 2024 integration roadmap. If you want this or the expanded version, check it out over at salesforcementor.com or there are links in the description. If you think I've missed something on this list, let me know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear it. We'll make some updates and we can totally talk about it. This is the first time I'm doing this so we can make revisions as we go along. If you're watching this and a little confused with some of the terminology that I used or integrations is a little bit ahead of you, check out this video, which is the Salesforce developer roadmap that I created, something that you can follow and eventually get here for integrations. As always, I'm Walters954. Thanks so much for watching and I believe in you.